Welcome back, guys, to another roundtable. My name is Adam. With me once again, I have Victor. Hi, everyone. And today we have a very special guest. His name is Kang Wei Chin. Hi, everyone. He's from SGX. He's the product manager of ETFs at uh, SGX. And he's going to share with us today a lot of information about ETFs and how you can construct an investment portfolio using ETFs. I think ETFs are pretty popular among yep. investors here, right? Yep. And around the world as well. So we're going to talk a bit about ETFs, the different ETFs that there are on the SGX and you know how you can basically create a portfolio out of that. All right. So before I begin, I guess introductions are in order. Uh, tell us a bit more about yourself and what you do at the SGX. Yeah, thanks Adam. So uh, myself as a product manager for ETF, I manage the product life cycle of ETF on SGX. I also work with the industry participants to increase the awareness of ETF investing in Singapore. All right. So I think uh, I think ETFs have grown quite a bit over the last yeah. I think few years. Especially for retail investor, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty popular. And I mean, I think a lot of times, uh, you know, retail investors usually think about ETFs in terms of stocks, like stock yep. ETFs mm -hmm. or the STI ETF, which is our index. But there are many different kinds of ETFs on the SGX, right? Not just equity ETFs, right? So tell us a bit more about the different kinds of ETFs that there are on the SGX. Yep. So in recent years, we've indeed seen a strong growth in the usage of ETFs on SGX platform. Fund size has almost doubled. Currently, it's about uh, around $12 billion. Wow. And the users include institutions. They make up about 70% of total holdings, while retail and robot advisors make up the rest. In general, there are four, four main asset classes that retail investors invest in Singapore. And these four key asset classes include uh, Equities ETF mm -hmm. that covers both local and foreign equities, fixed income, which includes bonds, mm -hmm. money market instruments, in denominated in USD, SGD, and RMB. Mm -hmm. Also, REITs that include Singapore and foreign REITs markets. Lastly, investors can also use Go ETF mm -hmm. as part of the uh, asset diversification for the portfolio. All right, so stock e stocks, uh, REITs, yep. fixed income, and uh, what was the last one? Gold. Gold. Yep. All right, so these are the four asset classes that. Uh, I mean, investors can find they're uh, listed on the SGX. So I noticed that, I mean, you mentioned that um, institutions have 70%, you know, re of representation in ETFs. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to ETF asset classes, which ones are more popular with, you know, retail, with institutions, or like you said, robo-advisors, uh, uh, you know, how, how do they, you know, pick and choose what kind of ETFs they like? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, in fact, retail are more active investing into equities and REIT ETFs. Currently, equities ETF make up nearly 70% of the individual investor portfolio. REITs form the second largest asset class with 13% in allocation, followed by fixed income ETFs at 10% and gold at 8%. Okay. But when we look at CPFIS and SRS alone, equities allocation is higher at 80% of allocation with rel relatively lower REIT and uh, fixed income allocation. This can be due to the nature of uh, SRS and CPFIS are uh, generally for longer term. Mm -hmm. And there is also a higher interest rate offered uh, by the CPFIS and IA and S SA account, OA and SA account. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, when it comes to stocks, so you're saying retail investors just kind of like stocks uh, in and general. Reads. And REITs, right? Yeah. So, I mean, what is there a reason why they don't go with like fixed income ETFs? Do you do, do you have any ETF or gold? Do you have an insight on that? Yeah, I think if you look at the way um, investors allocating their investments into into in general, I think they, it's not uh, it's not very low in terms okay. of uh, REIT fixed income or gold. It's make up nearly thirty percent or slightly over thirty percent of the entire investment portfolio. Mm -hmm. It's only towards. Uh, investing using their SRS monies or okay. CPF. I think there's a, a attempt to uh, invest into products like equities ETFs, mm -hmm. which uh, allows them to ride through the volatility, mm -hmm. which I think in general is is, is, is mainly what's the actions uh, typical investors would take if they are looking at uh, maximizing their long-term growth mm -hmm. of their portfolio. Um, another point, of course, fixed income ETF is something relatively new mm. in the industry compared to equities ETF. Its, uh, its historical record is a lot shorter, mm -hmm. but we do see a, a stronger growth rate in terms of the AUM we have gathered in recent years. Okay. Uh, early adopters remains to be the institutional houses mm -hmm. because uh, a key reason is just because of market access, right? Because the ins institutions when they are using fixed income ETF, they are looking to overcome some of the challenges that they face. First of all, um, market access into a, a 
restricted markets mm -hmm. like China or India, I think these warrant a much more efficient tools for them to gain access into this onshore bond market without setting an onshore, say, an onshore custodian account. Mm -hmm. The same would be applied to retail investors. In today, there is no easy way for you to own a China bonds, mm -hmm. onshore bonds, or India onshore bonds. But through ETFs, um, you can, in fact, diversify into hundreds of uh, uh, bond issuance in the onshore market. And uh, even offshore markets, it's not easy for individuals or even institutions to mm -hmm. buy into hundreds of bonds. Mm -hmm. But then a bond ETF eventually would allow them to uh, to gain access to these uh, these markets easily. All right. So I guess it sounds pretty complicated to me, man. I'm just a retail investor myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, when you talk about all that stuff, it, it seems like there's a bit to learn. I mean, ETFs are just, it seems like a simple instrument. It's kind of like a diversified you know, way of investing, getting exposure to a particular sector. But there are things that you would have to consider as well before you pick an ETF, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's bonds or it's fixed income or REITs. It's, 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 that's correct, right? Yep. Yep. So, I mean, uh, I think I want to highlight REIT ETFs mm -hmm. because I think uh, it's so popular with Singaporeans yep. in general. Uh, whenever we talk about REITs, uh, the interest is there as well. So, uh, let's talk about REIT ETFs. Can you tell us a bit more about the REIT ETF industry in Singapore particularly? Because I think we're one of the strongest mm -hmm. REIT markets in Asia Pacific. Uh, how is the REIT market for ETFs? I mean, the e REIT ETF market, what's it like uh, over the last few years? Yep, so um, I think that's a very good point. REIT ETF itself has grown a lot by in, in terms of the users, mm -hmm. in terms of the AUM it has scheduled. In the last two years, it has doubled in its uh, total AUM raised mm -hmm. from retail investors. And the, the reasons are pretty straightforward. It has the benefits that most that ETFs itself brings to investors. Benefit of diversification. Mm -hmm. In investors don't have to look for a single REIT uh, market or even a single industry sector that they're invest investing into. Through a REIT ETF, they can get instant exposure to all the REIT sectors and even regional markets, including mm -hmm. Asia or APEC market uh, via single ETFs. Accessibility. So even if an investor, individuals has ability and capital to execute 30 stocks, um, the ETFs does allow them to go beyond a single market. So for instance, if an investor is looking to invest into global or Asia equities, or rather Asia REIT uh, markets, that may include more than 10 different exchanges, ETFs offer that uh, flexibility. The third point, transparency. Uh, individuals can get access to the pri price, the fund information, and the index underlying constituents at any point of time. And that is a transparency that typically are unlisted or mutual funds doesn't offer to investors. Uh, last but not least, I think one point is on the uh, correlation or rather the diversification benefits of REITs against equities and bonds. Mm -hmm. um, if you are looking at the correlation uh, matrix between a uh, REIT itself and the traditional asset class such as global equities and global bonds, you can see that it shares a much lower uh, correlation. And hence, at times of uh, market volat volatility, it helps you to break through that. All right. So, you, so you're saying that, I guess, I think REITs are, I, I think REITs in general are simpler uh, asset to understand. It's mm -hmm. kind of like you own land, property, you collect rent. Whereas when it comes to a, a business, you know, with its operations, there are a lot of moving parts. You need to understand how a business makes money. That gets a bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. So I guess REITs are just something that naturally a lot of people like. And I guess in Asia, property is something that we all aspire to own. And a REIT is a kind of like a shortcut to get there. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, so I guess REIT ETFs have benefited from that as well over the last many years. It's grown in you know, the number of users, like you said. The AM has, has, has picked up as well. Any of the popular REIT ETFs that... Um, that Know, that you know of in Singapore at this point in time? I think the one that have gathered a uh, strong interest in retail uh, interest or mm -hmm. the, in the retail space mm -hmm. is mainly the Singapore REIT ETFs okay. uh, because I think a lot of investors do have familiarity among okay. the Singapore REITs. All right. However, uh, they may lack of a time or the expertise to choose uh, which is the REIT that uh, they should be investing into. Mm -hmm. So if they are having a mindset that I do need some S REIT exposure mm -hmm. due to the, uh, the, the, the dividend that it offers, due to the access of market that it offers, then REIT ETF in the Singapore REIT market is good for them. All right. another, another key markets we have seen interest, not only from the investors itself, but also from issuers who are bringing on new products to the exchange. 
probably on the APEC market or Asia X Japan markets. Um, these, two as, these two markets has uh, offer investors diversification benefits. Mm -hmm. So for investors who is already vested into Singapore REIT markets, uh, Asia X Japan mm -hmm. or APEC uh, REIT market might offer them that kind of additional exposure into a more diversified REIT portfolio. Okay, so what is the most popular uh, S REIT ETF right now? Currently, if you look at uh, our platform, mm -hmm. uh, there are two S3 ETFs. Um, whether, how do you determine whether it's popular? I think one of the measurement could be on fund sizes. Okay. Uh, but both have received a uh, pretty strong investor interest, I would say over the last uh, 12 months. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of them, uh, the, the CSOP IH S3 leader is ETF mm -hmm. has just was just listed in uh, November last year. Okay. And he has raised over a million, $100 million at a point of time, mm -hmm. which has shown a strong interest from retail investors, uh, even even for a second re S3 ETF on our exchange. So that's the second one. That's yeah. the second so one. So the first one, I think, was it the Lion Philip? S3? Lion Philip. In yeah. fact, Lion Philip has grown to uh, around $300 million okay. in terms of AUM. Mm -hmm. uh, from uh, at the listing, it was also $100 million. All right. So we do see that the market, in fact, is uh, big enough. The interest is strong enough. Uh, to uh, to welcome the two S3 ETF on the on yep. the exchange. All right, so this is not a recommendation to buy or sell any of these ETFs that we mentioned. Uh, this is just purely for educational purposes only. So I mean, I remember being at the Lion Philip S3. Um, there was like this briefing yeah. when they were about to launch it, and it was pretty interesting at that point in time because I mean we've studied REITs for a long time, yep. and we love them as a as a as a dividend uh, yep. investment super stable mm -hmm. uh, I mean if you pick the right ones anyway <laughs> right so you don't pick the wrong ones um, but that was the first time that there was a, a REIT ETF mm -hmm. for I mean uh, Singapore just a purely Singapore uh, e REIT ETF and at that point in time I remember that they had this uh, issue with the tax transparency right mm -hmm. where they would um, there would be taxes on the ETF if you invested through the ETF and that has been taken away yeah Right. So right now it's kind of like almost the same picking your own ETF. Mm -hmm. I mean, picking your own reads and picking your own ETFs, full, full text transparency. Uh, and uh, for someone who doesn't want to pick their own reads, this is a pretty convenient way to just kind of mm -hmm. like get into the Singapore read market, correct? Yep. 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 So I mean, uh, a lot of advantages when it comes to the Singapore read market. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's limited space here. I mean, a lot of them I know are expanding overseas yep. as well. But I think there's still a lot of benefits when it comes yep. to. Uh, Singapore reads. But of course, there's also other options in the SGX, right? There's this, the one that you talk about, the overseas is the Nikko AM Street Trading Asia X Japan, is it? Yep. In yep. fact, that's the largest uh, REIT ETF listed on SGX. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. It does have a high uh, S Street exposure though. Okay. Over 70% is still S Street. Okay. Oh, okay. Simply because Singapore is the largest uh, REIT market in Asia X mm. uh, Japan. So region. it's a bit more diversified in that sense okay. that it's not just pure Singapore. Yeah. So fact, you still get yeah. Singapore and 30% of Overseas yeah. reads exactly yeah. close to close to thirty percent. In fact, it has some of the ASEAN neighboring countries. All right. So if you are uh, a firm believer that uh, over time the emerging markets would also have their own read, uh, yeah. see their own success in mm -hmm. in the read space, then this is a product that allows you to gain exposure. To would you believe? Would you think that? I mean, in your own view or opinion, do you think that? I mean, there are more growth opportunities outside of Singapore when it comes to the read market, or is like Singapore still kind of like? this is the place to be. I think it really depends on what uh, what kind of uh, allocation you're looking to have in your okay. portfolio. Right. In fact, Singapore REITs do have a strong exposure towards the regional property or real estate uh, markets. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not purely a, a Singapore uh, property per se REIT market. It, has, it covers uh, regional markets, including China. It covers as far as US and European uh, REITs okay. or other property uh, exposures. Mm. So if you are looking for a global portfolio diversification, Singapore REITs do offer that in mm -hmm. terms of the num the type of properties it has in the basket. Okay. Uh, but of course, if you are looking for a bit more diversification, um, uh, I would say AXJ REIT is a potential one. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one is the UOB Green REIT okay. ETF that was recently listed. That offers you exposure, a significant exposure into Japan REIT market. Okay. So I think end of the day, investors need to be uh, aware of the sort of read they are looking to expose into, mm -hmm. uh, have a firm understanding into uh, what sectors or what geographical regions that it covers. Mm -hmm. And if you are you have no time, mm -hmm. or you are not really uh, involved into analyzing single reads, mm -hmm. I think end of the day, read ETF still gives you the uh, uh, 
the 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 edge over um over read picking. Okay, I mean, if you have the interest and the time, yep. I mean, read picking is great because I think it's a pretty s- relatively simpler way to you know pick a pick a stock in a sense. But I I mean, I hearing hearing from what you've just shared about you know uh, Asia X Japan exposure in different markets, it seems like there's still stuff that you need to do a bit of research on when you pick a read ETF because there's I mean. Around, I mean, in Singapore, we have a few REIT ETFs. Around the world, we have so many ETFs. Do you still need to do some research, in a sense, right, to basically pick the best ETF, in a sense? Would you Would you agree with that? Yeah, I do have to agree that individual investors, be it you're doing a single REIT investing okay. or ETF investing, always need to do your own due diligence, okay. uh, making sure that you understand the products. And on SGX website, there is an ETF screener page mm-hmm. that offers investors uh, uh, tools that allow them to filter into geographical regions, filter into the top performance based on historical records, okay. based on the expense ratios, as well as uh, dividend uh, yield they has paid out in the recent years. Okay. So I think this offer investors uh, probably a good overview on uh, what ETFs out there mm-hmm. and what are the parameters that they can look out for. Yeah. Uh, ob- obviously, uh, they, they should be reading it, the product mm-hmm. and understand what it's what it what it covers mm-hmm. before uh, putting any investment into it. All right, yeah. so it's pretty pretty uh, yep. useful. I mean, a, a screener is it's not just for re- ETFs; right? it's all ETFs on e- SGX, right? Yeah. So like bonds and uh, gold and stocks and everything. everything. So on the screener, you could yeah. uh, screen out the asset classes. Okay. So your key interest is purely re- ETFs. Then uh, that's a way to uh, screen out the other asset classes and focus your list onto the uh, the few uh, re- ETFs all on right. SGX. So I think we're gonna flash out a QR code. Where mm-hmm. basically you can just kind of like uh, f- use your phone to visit that uh, ETF screener from the SGX if you want. Of course, we'll put them in the link in the description as well. In the, in the I mean, link in the description as well. Uh, but I think that's a pretty useful tool that you have uh, in that, you know, people can basically find out what uh, makes sense for them and then invest according to what they need or what their risk profile is because not one size fits all. Even even when it comes to ETFs, because people might think an ETF is diversified. I can just buy whatever I want and they don't care so much about the risk, but then you still have to take into account um, things uh, before you invest, yep. right? Yeah, so I mean, I think at this point in the discussion, I just want to ask like, uh, you know, how do you start, let's say uh, someone who is watching this, right? They hear all this information about ETFs. I mean, we focus a bit more on ETFs in this uh, round table, but like you mentioned, there are stock ETFs, mm-hmm. uh, there's gold, there are fixed income as well. Um, and then, of course, REITs. Uh, you know, there's so many different kinds of REITs and so many different REITs in each asset class. How does an individual watching this uh, decide if I, hey, I want to start investing, I don't want to do stock picking. How do I pick the right ETFs for myself? How, how, how would you do it? What are the best practices? I think if I were the person um, who, who is thinking about which ETF to buy, I think the first question that comes before that would mm. be what, kind of uh, portfolio allocation I'm having today. Okay. Uh, what's my level of uh, disposable income mm-hmm. or rather investable income mm-hmm. that can be used to put into investments. Mm-hmm. And only after you have uh, done a, a, a personal al- analysis of uh, your portfolio, how much money do you need? I think as always, the 101 of personal finance uh, advice is to always have uh, emergency fund, your rainy days funds, uh, making sure that you're well covered for the next three to six months, should any uh, um, unexpected events happen. Then look at your portfolio, how much ex- excess cash mm-hmm. that you're looking to, to make it work harder for you. Mm-hmm. And I think most people would say that cash is, is you shouldn't keep 100% cash because mm-hmm. of inflation. Yep. And it's real today, given yep. that inflation rate is climbing yeah. up. It's but very real today. It's you can feel it. Real, how right? much yeah. is, uh, I, I remember sharing the story with them. Uh, I played of chicken rice. Could you guess how much I, played, I paid <laughs> for a plate of chicken rice? Guess eight dollars. Yeah, eight dollars. You watch. You watch yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I pay eight dollars yeah, for a plate chicken. of chicken rice. That, 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 I right. couldn't believe it, but I just, I just, I just needed a protein for that day. But <laughs> <laughs> eight dollars. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah, inflation. I'm sorry. I mean, sorry to cut you off. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 but yeah, is it inflation is yeah. is true. Yeah. So hundred percent cash is scary yeah. because let's say inflation is five percent. You are eroding five percent. Next year, your one million become nine hundred fifty thousand. Right. Yeah. Because of five percent yeah. erosion. 
but likewise, hundred percent to stocks. It sounds scary as well because yes. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, S and P can drop by 10, 20 percent over a yeah. period. Yep. We have seen that during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, what is the right balance? I think end of the day, it, be, it depends on your individual uh, risk tolerance, ability to take risk, and also stability to take risk. Right? Mm -hmm. Because if you are close to retirement, you have set up a funds which you have projected based on what you need for your retirement. Then, should you put everything into equities? probably very high risk, mm -hmm. right? Because your retirement might be jeopardized if there's a large uh, drawback or rather drawdown on the investments. So once you know which type of investment mix you should be working towards, be it a 40% uh, bonds, 60% mm -hmm. 60 stocks, or even 20% bonds, 20% read, 10% gold, and the rest into stocks. Once you have that kind of allocation in mind, then you can look at the tools that are available, the okay. ETF that are available, and try and feel and, and make up the missing pieces, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that is the, the way that you would be able to fully maximize the advantages of ETFs mm -hmm. rather than just uh, chasing after the performance because right. every year the top performer will change, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It yep. could be uh, Vietnam the one year and Indonesia the, the other year. But that doesn't mean you should always swing your portfolio to the best performing markets. Okay. So I think you should have a holistic view. Mm -hmm. before you, you, you try to piece in any of these ETFs mm -hmm. that offer either you a single market exposure, a regional market exposure, a global market exposure to make your uh, portfolio more diversified. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of yeah. sense. I think we, I mean, anytime we, anyone asks us what, I mean, we get a lot of questions almost every day and they always, uh, some of the questions come, say, what should I buy? And so I can't tell you what to buy. Yeah. Number one, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to tell you what you should buy because. And the more important thing is that I don't know who you are. Yep. You're right. I don't know what your financial situation is like. I don't know what your risk profile is like. So what makes sense for someone else may be just totally is wrong for you. So we never answer those kind of questions, and we kind of like ask them questions back and ask them, mm -hmm. "What do you want to achieve? How do you want to? How do you?" How do you do? You want passive income? Are you looking to retire? Or do you want to looking for growth? What kind of, uh, you know, countries are you in comfortable investing in? They have to answer those questions yep. themselves, and then they pick the things that suit them. Those that, that their profile basically. Yep. So even when it comes to other stocks or ETFs, it's the same thing, right? So like you said, uh, someone may not be interested in uh, bonds at, mm -hmm. at all, and mm -hmm. it just goes hundred percent. Yep. In or just reads and and stocks as well. Yeah, so I think I think there's a there's a key takeaway that you need to know, uh, especially if you're looking to start to invest, uh, if you're still new and all that. All right, so before we wrap up, just any final words about you know um, you know SGX uh, or the ETFs that we have in general here. I think the key takeaway I hope that uh, uh, investors who are watching this series would better understand um, um, what are the opportunities, okay, or rather investment tools out there. But always bear in mind, um, you should, before you make any investment decision, always understand what do you need mm -hmm. rather than, than, than just uh, uh, putting your investment without any proper uh, financial planning. Okay. All right. So I think yep. that goes back. This is very, very uh, solid advice in general, yep. which we always talk about. All right. So thank you so much. I mean, this is Wei Chin from the SGX. He's the ETF product manager at SGX. Thank you so much for sharing all your insights. Uh, and it's been very useful to learn all these things, especially from an institutional perspective. I mean, from, uh, from us, yep. we're typically retailers, as so retail investors ourselves, and we do our own research, but it's good to have someone from institutions as well, especially from uh, SGX. All right. So once again, if you're interested in the uh, e ETF screener that the SGX has, we can flash up the QR code. There's a link in the description as well. If you want a full list of the SGX listed ETFs as well, we'll send you another QR code right now as well and the link in the description as well. So so if you're interested in ETFs that the SGX has to offer, do check out those resources. There's no recommendation to buy or sell anything like we've discussed on this roundtable. It's basically understanding yourself and what you want out of your investments before picking the ETFs that suit you, right? All right. Yep. So once again, my name is Adam. That is Victor. Thank you. This is Wei Chin from the SGX. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, it's been, it's been a pleasure. All right. And thank you for watching this. If you like this roundtable, please hit the like button. Tell us if you're doing a great job. Of course, any questions about ETFs, we love to answer them in the comment section as well. And of course, subscribe to our channel. Many more roundtables come up. And we'll see you around again.